you, Cassie, and thank you for joining us today. Wonderful. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate that. And thank you very much for having me uh, come speak today and for all of the attendees. I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, so when I was asked to, to come give a talk, I spoke with some of the colleagues that I work with, some of the basic scientists about what would be exciting, what would they want to hear about. And I he heard consistently that giving some background about what happens on kind of the clinical research or the translational side of things and what are some of the current advancements or current progress that are ongoing or upcoming would be really helpful. Um, and so as we start today, well, if I can advance my slides, there we go. Um, I, I'm going to start out with um, a general review of some of the historic clinical trial designs that have been used in both pediatric and young adult central nervous system to, uh, tumors, early phase clinical trials, but also historic clinical trials. And then I would like to move from that point into an introduction of some of the contemporary trials where we're building on precision-based approaches, novel delivery systems, and then moving into some of the target validation efforts that we're more and more incorporating into our trials. And then lastly, I'll close out with some of the upcoming or ongoing clinical trials that are using more innovative biostatistical designs, uh, new novel therapy combinations, and then more robust biospecimen collection that ideally we will turn back in to additional advancements in how we're treating children and young adults with central nervous system tumors. So just to get us started off, as I said, I'll just give a brief overview of historical clinical trial designs. And, and I start with that because I do think it is important in terms of the context of where we have come from in bringing new therapies to this patient population and where perhaps we should be going some of the pitfalls that I believe we should be closing the gaps on and how we're aiming to do that. And so I'm starting off with a very rudimentary figure um, of what we consider one of the most tried and true and standard clinical trial designs when we think about an early phase or a phase one clinical trial. And that is this three plus three design. And some of you may be very familiar with this, and certainly many publications have reported that it's used in 96 to 98% of early phase or phase one clinical trials um, for novel therapies and specifically for cancer um, directed novel therapies. And the general outline of this is that you have multiple dose levels and that there's a certain number of patients within each dose level that are allowed to experience what's called a dose limiting toxicity. And these are defined according to protocol criteria about what is and what is not an acceptable toxicity with a new drug. And they are many times organ-based. They can be certainly drug specific, but ultimately the goal is that you have no more than about 17% of patients within any of these dose levels that has one of these DLT experiences. And so you start out essentially with three patients coming in. If zero or three of these patients have a DLT, you will escalate to the next dose level. If one of three have one, then you have to enroll three more patients and look at the tolerability in those three patients. And if two or out of three, two or more out of three have a toxicity, then you're either going to decrease the dose or you're going to potentially stop the trial due to toxicity, just depending on where you are in the trial. And the goal is that only one out of six of these patients at each one, any given dose level will have experienced a DLT. This is a very straightforward design. It's, it's, as I said, most people are familiar with this design that are involved in clinical research. And so it's used time and time again. The problem with this design is that it does seem to lead to patients being treated more frequently at sub-therapeutic doses. Um, it's very cumbersome in the length of time it may take to enroll the sufficient number of people at each one of these dose levels, which can be both laborious in terms of time, but also money. Um, and additionally, it's, it's pretty stringent and doesn't allow much flexibility in terms of additional considerations that should be brought into clinical trial design. So I wanted to start here, and certainly that's not the only clinical trial design, but just to give a basis as to this is what we have done historically and to set the um, field for where I'm hopeful that we will, we are going and that we continue to go. 
The other part about historic clinical trial designs that can be limiting is a single drug approach. And certainly the point of a phase one trial is to assess toxicity and safety. But the, the problem with that is that most of our high grade malignant brain tumors in particular are not driven by a single mutation that can be targeted with a single agent. So intrinsically, a single agent approach is going to be limited. And I use this figure here on the right. Um, it's called a Sinky diagram. And it's a summary of a recent clinical trial that we finished, um, PNOC003, which was a precision-based approach where we enrolled patients with newly diagnosed uh, diffuse intrinsic contine granuloma. We performed a biopsy. And then based on molecular sequencing, we selected uh, four F up to four FDA approved drugs to treat them with after completion of radiation therapy. And what you'll appreciate is that the patients on the left um, obviously are an N of one. And then as you move through the right side to the right side of the Sinky diagram, you can see with all of the overlapping lines, the variety of alterations that each one of these patients actually had and the number of agents that were potentially selected to move forward with a combination molecularly based approach. So this is really just a glimpse into, into how we need to be more thoughtful than just single agent designs. And certainly, again, single agents are helpful in terms of investigating the initial safety, but we need to be more facile in terms of rapidly translating. Once we've confirmed that safety, what are, we, what are the next steps in thinking about combination therapies um, or ways in which we're um, delivering the drug, et cetera. Some of the challenges that we face in these types of multi-agent designs are sometimes convincing industry partners to come along with us in that. And that is many times driven by the fact that certainly if you have a drug that proves to be toxic as part of a combination, it can negatively impact that drug as a single agent. However, I think that we should still be be, you'll see in the future slides that there are ways and there are mechanisms that we can still be thoughtful and innovative in bringing together combination strategies that are more likely to be efficacious down the line. And certainly the approach of a single agent and a single target also does not accommodate for resistant mechanisms that may develop in these diseases, activation of alternative pathways, and then also potential for additive and synergistic effects. And then the next thing that I think is really important when we think about designing clinical trials for central nervous system tumors is the barrier that is imposed by us through the blood brain barrier system. And this is a intrinsic barrier between vasculature and the central nervous system space to intrinsically keep out things that are harmful or injurious to the brain and the spine. So evolutionarily, it makes perfect sense as to why something like this would be in place. However, when you have a cancer that is concentrated within the brain or the spine, it's also very good at keeping out effective therapies. And so one of the ways that we have had gaps historically is that we may decide a drug is safe in a phase one setting and we move forward with it, let's say in an efficacy phase two environment, and it, we fail to see impacts in our overall survival or our objective response rates, whatever our endpoints may be. But we're not necessarily always asking ourselves, why is it failing? Presumably, if we brought a drug to a clinical trial, that's because we had good evidence from a lab and preclinically that this drug was working and that it had promise. But perhaps we get to the, the clinical setting and that just does not fully translate. And we need to be thoughtful about, is that just because it is not hitting its target is it not causing downstream effects? And then certainly the figure on the right-hand side of the screen is a simplistic pathway model of, for instance, a low-grade glioma tumor and the pathways that are frequently altered in low-grade gliomas. You can see that there is potentially different pathways. There's different layers of this pathway that are going to be necessary to get to the point where you're having tumor transcription, growth, proliferation. We're fortunate with the RAS pathways um, and potentially with low-grade gliomas that we have targeted agents that have been proven to be efficacious. However, when you're outside of this space where you don't have an effective agent that translates well and you suspect it should be targeting a specific component of a molecular pathway that we know is active, we need to be asking ourselves, 
at what point is it failing? Is it not hitting its target? Is it not causing downstream impact? Is it because one of the partner parallel pathways has been activated? So these are the types of questions we need to be asking ourselves a priori at the time of clinical trial design, rather than in hindsight, so that we're robustly collecting information that will inform on this. And then the last point, but certainly not the only other pitfall in, in historic clinical trials, is that when we translate drugs to the clinical setting, we are finding that perhaps they're based on preclinical models that may not necessarily completely align with clinical reality. And I use the p 3 cohort again, and that is because for, as part of this trial, we certainly collected tumor and we performed sequencing to identify a clinically relevant treatment approach. But in parallel, and from an exploratory standpoint, we also aim to develop cell lines and we subsequently sequence those cell lines. And you can see across these three specific patients that certainly we have some overlapping key driver alterations, but then separately, there are a multitude of unique alterations that were either not present in the primary tumor or vice versa, not present in the cell line and present in the primary tumor. The reasons for this could be many and such that, or such as heterogeneity in terms of the part of the tumor from which the cell line is being grown versus being an analyzed for the clinical setting. Um, it could be the multiple passages that cell lines go through in the lab and they pick up alterations along the way. But I think until we start to understand these potential deficits, we are going to continue to hit hurdles in, um, in efficacious translation of effective agents. And so these are just the types of questions that we need to be having in our minds as we start to advance our clinical trial um, expertise. And so the next phase of the trial, as I've kind of reviewed some of the common shortcomings of historic phase one designs in hopes that we can build on these pitfalls and ultimately lead to more successful therapies and better outcomes for our patient population. I'd like to introduce some of the contemporary trials that are using more precision-based studies, novel delivery systems, and potentially target validation studies. And I'm gonna start this out focusing on diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is now more commonly grouped under a diffuse midline glioma diagnosis. And the reason I will spend a fair amount of time focusing on this disease during the talk is that we have now investigated this disease or this tumor for decades and have failed after multiple, multiple, multiple trials to have a clinical impact and to actually come together for a clear standard of care therapy that for these patients that leads to better overall survival. And these tumors are based within the brainstem. They are very intrinsic and infiltrating around to surrounding structures. And so they cannot be easily respected. And so we have to rely on other ways to treat and um, reach these tumors than we have historically. And so again, circling back to the PNOX003 study, this is a broad overview and I'll go into the next couple slides where I talk about the ways in which we were potentially successful and the ways in which we can, can still build on this trial. But essentially this was a trial directed at children and young adults with newly diagnosed DIPG. They had a radiographic diagnosis that was consistent with DIPG they were eligible for a biopsy and they underwent said biopsy with tumor collection that was subsequently put through whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing, and then a multidisciplinary molecular tumor board that utilized a drug matching algorithm to come up with this multi-drug approach. Separately, we completed exploratory aims where we aim to develop xenograft models, cell lines, um, circulating tumor DNA was collected, and then we also ultimately performed whole genome sequencing and then the patients from the molecular tumor board results or recommendations rather were able to go on undergo radiation as per standard of care and then continue this agent on the back end or the multi, multiple agents on the back end. So I start out with a toxicity table that we saw with this, with this trial. And the reason I wanted to move on to that is because we brought together agents very commonly in this trial that were not previously or not robustly combined. However, we saw very few patients that had severe toxicities to the point of grade three or grade four toxicities. And when they did occur, 
they were frequently hematologic toxicities that didn't necessarily require an actual intervention other than monitoring or maybe making some dose adjustments to accommodate for that. So I really think that this approach speaks to the potential support of bringing together multiple agents and potentially targeting these hard to treat diseases from multiple different directions, as opposed to kind of single agent approaches. The caveat to the story is that although this study was not powered to identify a difference between patients that did or did not follow our molecularly rec recommended tumor board treatment plans, we did not overall find a significant impact of this approach. And that was both when we compared those two cohorts side by side, and also when we looked at historical controls and the outcomes of this patient population. And I think that in the next couple of slides, we'll talk a little bit about why that may have been and ways in which we can continue to do better and not necessarily abandon this approach, but how can we be more thoughtful and actually more precise in our decision-making and our biologic specimen collection to improve where we are right now. And I'm focusing a lot on PNOC related studies today. Obviously that's my closest familiarity, but I do wanna highlight that these efforts are being done by a variety of different consortia. And so for instance, there um, around the same time that the PNOC 003 study was going, um, another collaborative group was doing the DIPG back study. So, and this is the DIPG biology and treatment study. So this study was a multi-institutional approach. They also used a biopsy approach and then um, subsequently a basket design. And what that means is that when patients demonstrate a specific marker, that they get put into a basket of a certain treatment. And so for this treatment, essentially patients underwent standard radiation with bevacizumab and then based on their biopsy results, and if they had an MGMT promoter methylation positivity or an EGFR expression or neither, they would get stratified to bevacizumab with erlotinib if it was EGGFR positive or to mesolamide if it was MGMT promoter methylation or a combination thereof. And I think that um, the point of this is that there are a number of ways in which we could potentially be thinking about bringing together these different types of precision-based approaches. But perhaps what's even more impacting about the combination of these studies that were done independently is the safety and tolerability that was also seen with these biopsy approaches. And I think that that's paramount in, in making progress as well, because for many years, we avoided biopsying these pontine lesions because of the concern for safety um, or surgical risk. But I think by looking at these multi-institutional biopsy-driven studies, even with this um, intricate anatomic location where we saw overall low rates of, of surgically related toxicity, it really shows us that in the right setting, in experienced hands, we can successfully get tissue and potentially collect biologic specimens that ideally we will grow from and expand our success. Similarly, while the, these um, previous trials were going on in the US, there is a separate biomedi multi-institutional effort. Um, and this is the biological medicine for diffusion intrinsic pontine glioma eradication. That was going that has been going on throughout Europe. Very similarly to um, the DIPG BATS study, in that it, these were biopsy driven tumors or biopsy driven trials, and looking specifically for markers, including a PGGFRA amplification, an EGFR overexpression, or P10 loss. And then within these markers, they were stratified to receive a certain drug. And all of these were combined with radiation and then continued as monotherapy post-radiation. Unfortunately, the trial was closed to futility because it was not able to meet its primary objective in terms of outcomes compared to historical controls. However, the group is now using this information as, I, as I'm hoping to convince you guys that we need to be doing more readily to inform their next phase of biomimic trials. And then I did spend a lot of time talking about DIPG um, and this isn't necessarily a phase one approach, but I want to extend that this approach in terms of molecularly risk stratified therapy selection should not necessarily be unique to um, just DIPGs or gliomas, but certainly there are other groups. The St. Jude's team has, um, is currently enrolling on SJME 12 
which is a clinically and molecularly risk-directed um, therapy for medulloblastoma based on some subgrouping from Wnt positivity, sonic hedgehog positivity, or non-Wnt non-sonic non hedgehog. And essentially based on these markers and risk stratification profiles, um, patients may or may not be eligible for reduced dose cranial spinal radiation, combination with a targeted therapy like mismotigib in the setting of sonic hedgehog active tumors, um, or combination with novel chemotherapies um, like a gemcitabine combination, a um, pemetrexid combination. And the other part about this that is thoughtful in that this study incorporates things like aerobic training and neurocognitive remediation. And the reason that I bring that up as well in terms of our design and information is that we want to add to these kids survival and we want to be collecting biologic um, specimens and biologic information from them as well. But we want them to get to the other end of these treatments and success stories with neurologic function and with good quality of life. And so these types of information points also um, are more readily and more commonly being incorporated, but certainly should continue to do so, um, so that we can utilize all of this information into designing better trials for these patients. So the next point that we had talked about was not just kind of how do we think about different combinatorial strategies? How do we learn from molecular information that we've gained from these tumors over time? But also how can we get through the blood brain barrier? And how can we think about novel drug delivery systems for these patients? And one way in which we've started to do that is utilizing convection enhanced delivery. And so what convection enhanced delivery provides is a mechanism to bypass the blood brain barrier and provide very high dose concentrated um, amounts of drug while avoiding systemic toxicities that you would get by giving your drug by mouth or through an IV. And so you have a catheter that's placed directly into the tumor. Um, specifically for the next couple of trials, I'll, I'll um, discuss it'll be within the pods, within a DIPG. And it utilizes a very slow, long infusion of drug where um, you get bulk flow or fluid convection throughout the tumor via a pressure gradient. And so it facilitates a very uniform concentration of drug throughout the target volume. There are two most readily used systems for this, a Renishaw system and a brain lab system. A Renishaw system is almost similar to a port in that it permanently implants a catheter with up to um, four different external um, line systems so that you can give drug delivery in an outpatient clinic and just basically hook up um, a drug directly to that port that's kind of exposed outside of the scalp. In contrast, and for the studies that I'm gonna go on to describe for um, PNAC009 and PNAC015, we used a non-permanent catheter system that was taken in, uh, uh, that was put in and uh, taken out every four to six weeks. And there are pros and cons to each, um, but some of the benefits of the brain lab system, as you'll see, I think are that you're potentially able to reach different areas of the tumor each time. The caveat is if the patient is going back for an invasive procedure every couple of weeks. So within PNX009 and 015, um, we first, the 009 utilized liposomal Renotecan, and this is building on some of the information that we had collected, for instance, from our 003 cohort, where we saw total isomerase one was frequently overexpressed in these tumors. And then alternatively, 015 used MTX110, which is a liquid form of cannabinostat, which is very common, or I shouldn't say common, but has gained um, in recent years a lot of excitement because of its potential targetability for the most common alteration seen in these diffuse midline gliomas is histone 3 k 27 m alteration. And so one of the things I want to point out in terms about these novel dr drug delivery systems and one of the benefits I think of um, the, the brain lab system and certainly the system and the trial that we had put in place here is that we did real-time imaging and we co-infused with gadoteridol with each one of these treatments. And you can see the four pictures on the left are one patient and the four pictures on the right are another patient. And each time we were potentially able to go in and target a different re region of the tumor with a different entry point. And this is just another example of that. And ideally these are the same kind of cuts but with different treatments and different entry points. And you can see that the distribution of the gadoteridol, which we anticipate is similar 
um, or somewhat of a reflection of the drug distribution. So it's slightly different each time. And that allowed us to review where the drug was going um, in both post-treatment, where it had gone, and then subsequently plan for the next treatment such that we were able to target areas that were not previously treated. And certainly we were also able to potentially um, manipulate the catheter in the operating room if we needed to, if we were not getting good coverage or if there was any issues with the drug distribution. So that does allow some flexibility and again, allows us to give a really concentrated amount of drug directly to the tumor. So the PNOX-015 with the MTX-110 compound is currently closed due to approval. But what we have found is that generally it was well tolerated despite the fact that it was an invasive procedure. And we had several patients that actually continued on therapy for up to or over a year. And one patient in particular had eight cycles of CED treatment and was, it was very tolerable. Um, and certainly we gained more experience as well with keeping patients or waking patients up even and finishing procedures in the ICU with them awake. Um, one of my favorite stories is a patient was actually in getting um, infused with drug while he was taking his online classes um, at school and did not seem to slow him down even a little, which was fantastic. Additionally, we've started to look at some of the survival curves. And I say this somewhat with um, caution because we do have early signs of preclinical promise when we look at these survival curves, but this data analysis is ongoing and we need to look at other confounding variables like re-irradiation or other treatments that patients got when they came off this therapy. But I think what we tended to see was that the tumor would recur outside of the treatment field. And certainly I think one of our biggest issues about treating DIPG in particular is actually getting drug into the target and getting control of the primary tumor. So this perhaps is showing us that maybe this is a mechanism that we can utilize to get control of primary tumor. And we need to be thinking about other therapies that can either be um, propagated outside of the primary tumor site, like an immune-based therapy, or systemic treatments that can be given in collaboration with CED to get local and distant control. So the last uh, trial or types of trials that I just wanna talk about in terms of things that we have recently done or um, are in the process of completing um, in terms of building on historical trials are the target validation studies. And this circles back to the question of knowing why or how a trial or a drug might fail. And so specifically, we, have, we are undergoing a target validation study with a drug called uh, Fimepinostat, and it's a combination HDAC and PI3 kinase inhibitor. And it's building on some of the preclinical work done by collaborators where it showed clinical promise for, with both uh, potentially TIPGs, high-grade gliomas, and medulloblastoma. So the benefit of choosing a drug that potentially hits not only different types of tumors, but tumors that arise in different anatomic regions is when we thought about this study and we thought about general clinical excitement for the agent, we wanted to, we felt like we also had an opportunity where we could inform, we have a promising agent across these different types of tumors. Can we collect information that tells us is there a different anatomic distribution or drug penetration within the central nervous system space based on diagnosis and based on anatomic location? So for this trial, we've designed it such that we actually give three doses of drug before a standard of care biopsy or surgery. And then we take out tumor and we actually look for the amount of drug in the tumor. And our primary endpoint here is not necessarily survival. It's not a safety standpoint but it's truly the amount of patients that have measurable drug in the tumor. Because we want to know, not only is this drug getting, potentially going to be efficacious, but if it's not, we wanna know why. Is it because it's just not getting tumor? And before we throw out a drug, we wanna make sure we're actually answering the question of why it's failing and are there ways in which we can be thinking innovatively about bypassing that. Further, we talk a lot in, contemporary trials about the potential for biomarkers. The caveat about biomarkers is that we don't necessarily robustly or haven't historically robustly collected information um, to readily inform what is a true, true effective biomarker. And what I mean by that is if either we don't have a 
clinical biomarker from a clinical specimen, or we don't have it correlated with a clinical outcome. So we might perhaps um, see a pathway marker in the lab, but it's a little more nuanced than to collect that from a patient post-treatment and then tie that back to clinical outcome. So in working with collaborators and specifically with uh, Dr. Rob Wexler-Rea, we did some proof of concept work to look at if we could isolate pre and, po and pre and post treatment tissue um, with uh, treated with clomipinostat if there were changes in acetylation and phosphorylation. So both ideally downstream targets of this drug. And what we found is that we could actually measure differences or changes over time, either from treated tissue as compared to historical controls, um, or in the setting of this trial, ideally we'll be using archival pretreatment tissue and then treated tissue. And we're now collaborating with Dr. Sriram Benetti at the University of Michigan as well to utilize some of the IHC acetylation quantification techniques that he's published on. And so again, not necessarily saying these are going to be definitive biomarkers of, of effect for the drug, but at least we are collecting the information in a way that ideally we will help inform or understand if a drug is getting in, is it causing its downstream effect, and is that translating to a clinical impact? And so as I finish up the talk, I wanna spend some time moving on to upcoming or ongoing trials that are utilizing innovative biostatistical designs, new therapy combinations, and more robust and informative biospecimen collection. And so from a contemporary biostatistical design platform, there are a number of new approaches out there. And I won't pretend to be a biostatistician, but I think it is important that we enter in as clinical trialists with the thought that we need to not only be novel in terms of what drugs we're coming in or bringing into trials or how we're delivering them, but also in our actual statistical design. And we need to be partnering with our biostatistical colleagues to help us be thinking about this so that we're not treating an excess number of patients at some therapeutic doses, or we're not taking five years to complete a trial because we're having to enroll more and more at each dose, um, dose level escalation. So some of the three approaches that I list here include a, a Boyan design, which is a Bayesian optimal interval design, an accelerated titration design, and then adaptive designs. So the, the accelerated titration design um, has a lot of benefits in that it does allow intrapatient dose escalation, which is not necessarily practice in a three plus three design. It also allows potential entry of additional dose levels and ideally treats less patients at some therapeutic doses. In an adaptive design, you have potential to have multiple arms of a trial kind of enter in or fall out based on a priori statistic, such that certain arms kind of can continue along if they show that they're being efficacious while other arms can fall out if it looks like they're not meeting a statistically uh, relevant cutoff or clinically relevant cutoff. Additionally, the adaptive design of, in the process of forming it, you can actually accumulate real-time data and feed back in to the conduct of the trial. And the Boyan design, I'll, I'll circle through the B of the diet, this uh, diagram here, because I think it's easiest to understand. So you can look at this quickly and think, oh, it looks very similar to perhaps a three plus three design. But what's interesting about a Boyan design is that you have some flexibility and it actually follows superior operating characteristics um, so that you have a continual reassessment method basically. And so you can set your target toxicity rate. So you'll remember that the three plus three design, we have a very stringent toxicity rate of anything you know, above basically 17% um, would potentially get um, ruled to be too toxic. So here, depending on how stringent you want to be in your criteria, you can set the toxicity rate. And then based on that toxicity rate, a patient and a, co well, a cohort size can potentially be adjusted. And a patient may actually de-escalate or escalate based on kind of the toxicity rate um, at a current dose. So, and similarly, you can, as I said, um, have intrapatient um, dose escalation uh, potentially, and then you would have the option to enroll smaller numbers, even N of one at your lowest dose levels. So again, 
the goal is to potentially be more flexible and move through the subtherapeutic dose levels more rapidly than would otherwise be available. The adaptive design, as I said, is more of a utilization of real-time information in terms of actually finding out if an arm is successful or if an arm is futile and feeding that back into the conduct of the trial. So rather than design, conduct, analyze, it's design, conduct, review, change, keep going. So you have this potential to really kind of inform in real time multiple different therapeutic interventions that may be coming in or falling out based on efficacy. And I think the a significant representation of kind of bringing a lot of the stuff that I've talked about here today into a successful clinical or translational effort um, is the efforts of a multi-institutional, international, um, multiple collaborator effort called the DMG Act. And essentially, the DMG Act is working to bring together multiple laboratories, academic institutions, basic scientists, clinical researchers, and form robust preclinical pipelines that then can rapidly be translated into an adaptive clinical trial platform such that we're able to have this kind of efficient circle where we're having preclinical analysis to identify drugs to bring into the clinical space. We're collecting biologic specimens and then feeding that back in. And then on the, on the um, clinical trial side of things, we have this adaptive platform design where we are also in real time making decisions about whether or not a drug makes sense to continue with or to drop out. And the benefit of all of the preclinical collaboration that we are working alongside is that we're doing in vitro and in vivo correlative studies. We're utilizing computational biology specialists, proteomic specialists, functional genomics, drug screens, et cetera. So really bringing together this multifaceted expertise and multifaceted approach to find a solution for one of the most difficult to treat um, pediatric cancers out there. So similarly to how I was talking about um, some of the pitfalls of our preclinical models or potential pitfalls, we are also casting a broad net in this DMG Act approach where we're utilizing a variety of different preclinical models and that could range from organoids to orthotopic PDX models and um, most recently these novel zebrafish models. And I wanna spend just one slide talking about the benefit of this zebrafish model and it's been an approach where we, it has facilitated successful rapid translation of drug screens and also toxicity assessments. And so you can see in the panel on that left side, very visibly, the zebrafish will demonstrate you know, changes, phenotypic changes based on toxicity related to dr increasing drug concentrations. And then subsequently, you have the opportunity to potentially biopsy or look at the anatomic region of interest um, very easily and quickly to identify specific organ systems that were um, particularly affected or um, un had toxic uh, phenotype changes. Um, and so I think that this has just been a really robust way and a rich way in which we are able to rapidly find um, dose recommendations and translate novel therapies to the clinical bedside. And what this looks like when it does reach a clinical trial um, standpoint is that we've now created this multiple cohort, multiple arm clinical trial, where we have using this preclinical data that we have um, amassed with our preclinical collaborators, we've selected some of these drugs and combinations of drugs that we think hold clinical promise for this approach. And, but we are following this adaptive platform design so that we have decided a priori, if a, one arm of one cohort doesn't necessarily meet the statistical criteria to continue in terms of clinical benefit, then that will drop out potentially. And at that point too, we have the opportunity to bring in new agents from real time ongoing preclinical work that's also happening in parallel. And so you have this continual evolution and ideally continual movement towards improved therapy options. The other part about the DMG Act approach that I wanna just talk on briefly is that 
we purposely wanted to include different cohorts that provide opportunity for patients at different points of disease. And I think the point of that or the benefit of that is not only are we more effective at getting a broader population um, access to therapy, but we tend to perform phase one or early phase clinical trials in the recurrent setting. And many times we question, is the drug failing in the recurrent setting because it's just too late, that horse is out of the gate, the disease has come back, um, and would it potentially be more efficacious up front? Or similarly, or in contrast, I guess, the, has the tumor changed in the recurrent setting that perhaps that approach doesn't make as much sense anymore? Um, and so we are hoping to kind of answer this question across all phases of disease. And then we also allow patients that are on the trial that perhaps progress through a certain combination to continue on the trial, but move to a different arm with a different therapy. Again, hoping that we are better informing the, on the biology of why or how an approach may not be working while also continuing to make sure that these drugs are accessible to this patient population. And I wanna completely close out by changing gears from DIPG, which we know is a devastating tumor in terms of survival, to a tumor that perhaps pretends long survival, but has devastating impacts on quality of life. And I think it's really important for us as we think about clinical trials, we think about novel drug therapies, not to forget uh, tumors like low-grade gliomas and craniopharyngiomas, which perhaps children go on to survive and live a really long time with these diseases. But what does that life look like on the other side of this? So for those not familiar with craniopharyngioma, there are two different types. Traditionally speaking, there's an adamantinomatous, which tends to include um, when pathway activation tends to affect the pediatric population. In contrast, you have a papillary subtype, sub which uh, carries the BRAF B600E tumors. Um, and, but the therapies tend to involve either surgical resec resection with or without radiation. And then unfortunately, when these tumors recur, it's somewhat of a rinse repeat situation. So can we resect it again? Can we re-irradiate? If they didn't get re-irradiation, or if they didn't get irradiation, can we irradiate at this point, et cetera. However, even with, or perhaps sometimes complicated by the surgical interventions or the radiation interventions, these kids suffer from devastating complications like vision changes, stroke risk, neuroendocrine injury, neurocognitive impairments. And so we need to do a better job of figuring out how better to treat these tumors. And it starts, I think, with a better biologic understanding. And so what we have now designed is a, a dual agent approach based on data that was um, initially published and presented um, by some of our co collaborators and others, highlighting um, a PD-1 pathway and RASMAP kinase pathways that are active in craniopharyngioma. And specifically, both of these pathways are potentially targetable with commercial agents. And they're actually isolated to distinct anatomic locations of the tumor. So PD-1 seems to be more concentrated within the cystic lining of these tumors. And the MAP kinase or um, pathway components seem to be perhaps more concentrated in these epithelial whorl components of the tumors. So perhaps by combining a dual agent approach, you're going to hit both targets of these problematic tumors. And certainly in um, at least one of the labs that started looking into these pathway components, they utilized a MEK inhibitor to treat uh, craniopharyngioma cell lines and, and found that with treatment of a MEK targeted agent trametinib, they did see decreases in KI67 index, index and they saw increases in caspase 3, which is a marker of apoptosis. So we had started to build on this knowledge and we got a pretty excited about it and started to think about how we could bring this into a clinical trial for these patients. And at the same time, some of our um, colleagues within um, the Children's Brain Tumor Network and in collaboration with an NCI CPTAC effort, which is a Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, were putting together this proteogenomic analysis of over 200 pediatric brain tumor samples of about 200 patients. And so they did a comprehensive genomic profiling and proteomic profiling across a diverse group of, of brain tumors. But what was interesting is that they identified a previously un, um, unrevealed distinction in two groups of uh, pediatric craniopharyngioma. 
So utilizing a consensus clustering approach, they isolated out this C4 group outlined in blue in contrast to the C8 group or cluster. And what they found is that um, the C4 group really aligned and clustered very um, repeatedly with a BRAF B600E low-grade gliomas. In contrast, the C8 cluster ended up falling into the BRAF wild type low-grade glioma category. And so this really was quite surprising, but also motivating in terms of, wow, this this, there is a component of these tumors that definitely seems to be aligned with this like MAP kinase RAF um, pathway activity and further informed whether we should be targeting this. And the, the teams with CBTN and the CBTAC effort, they took this one step further and they did kinase activity scoring based on the abundance of phosphorylated kinase substrates. And they found again that in the C4 cluster that falls with the BRAF E600E low-grade gliomas, that MAP kinase 1 and MAP kinase 3 activity scores were very upregulated and perhaps would signal that MAP, MAP MEK inhibition would be efficacious in this tumor. And then additionally, they added on some immune-based profiling. And so they looked at PD-1 and CTLA-4 expression and actually found that it was prevalent across both of these clusters. So again, all of this was really, really timely as we were thinking about our clinical trial and they were developing this, um, this report because it really helped inform and, and feed into the background and our design and support of our approach. So we've now come together to put um, a combination therapy um, concept. And what that involves is, again, we want to be answering the right questions from the outset. So let's try this therapy that is very apparently supported by preclinical work, by markers of pathway activity in this tumor. Let's target those, but let's be thoughtful. Let's collect information that if it doesn't work, we're going to be able to answer why and how and inform this next round of treatment options for this patient population. So for this trial, we will be doing um, a randomization target validation component where we will be, we're collaborating with uh, day one therapeutics to utilize a PANRAF inhibitor. And we're um, working on securing nivolumab as a PD-1 inhibitor right now. And we're gonna give them either a dose of nivolumab, a dose of day 101 or a combination therapy before they're going to the OR for their standard of care biopsy or surgery. And then we're gonna collect um, informative biologic specimens. And on the back end, those with measurable disease will continue on with combination therapy. Those that are able to achieve a gross total resection will not come off study, will continue to follow them for follow-up, but they won't necessarily require therapy on the back end. But the important part about what we're doing, or one of the most important parts, I think, is that we really want to inform on the biology of craniopharyngioma in a robust way that can certainly inform how we're treating these patients in the future. And so as part of these um, efforts, we are collecting a rich, resource or catalog or library of biologic specimens. And we're partnering really closely with Dr. Todd Hankinson at Colorado Children's, um, and we'll be performing IHC and multiplex ion beam imaging of specimens, um, single cell and single nucleus RNA sequencing. And then alongside Dr. Mandy Polovich in her lab at the Hutch, we'll be performing robust proteomic analysis. We're also working with um, Dr. Uh, Matteo Sudoral at NYU to do methylation-based immune profiling. We'll be performing ELISA-based cytokine analysis, and we'll ultimately be trying to refine accretion of preclinical models for this disease as well, because there has been a paucity of that historically, and ideally we want to, again, inform the next trials that we're bringing into clinical care for these patients in a, um, in a setting that has been tested robustly in a preclinical model. So I've moved through kind of where historic clinical trials for the pediatric and young adult central nervous, nervous system tumor space have been, where we have had some successes or identified areas in which we still need to grow, and then really kind of closed out with some of the trials and ways in which I think we are preparing ourselves to better inform and advance therapy options for these kids in the future. I'm hopeful that the you as the audience will take away that there is still much room to grow and expand on historical clinical trials. And I think we're now starting 
to close some of those gaps. We still have room to go. And I think we're still in the learning process. And I want to encourage investigators, you know, don't just think about the drugs we're bringing into space or how we're delivering the drugs or combinations, but also let's be thinking about biostatistical designs. Let's collaborate with our biostatistical um, experts and let's be thoughtful, but perhaps not so timid when we're thinking about novel combination therapies. And, and um, I think our patients and our families, you know, they would like to see, they obviously are always anxious to be aggressive. So let's force ourselves to potentially also be uncomfortable in thinking about ways in which we should be innovative. And perhaps we'll find that the benefit will ultimately outweigh the risk. And then lastly, I think in many ways we have room to expand from a historic paradigm of limitations in biospecimen collections. And I think, you know, we have now had multiple biopsy um, based trials and target validation trials now that we should be thoughtful in really capitalizing on some of the um, molecular, genomic, proteomic profiling that's available to us and more richly informing on the biology of these diseases and how they're changing, how they arise, and how we should be treating them. So I thank you all so much for attending the talk today. I thank you, Alice, the Lemonade Stand Foundation for asking me to attend. Um, and certainly the Pacific Pediatric Neural Oncology Consortium leadership members are integral to everything that I do. Um, collaboration with the Children's Brain Tumor Network and just the innumerable collaborators and researchers and consortium that are all joining in this effort to find better treatments for these kids. But most importantly, of course, our patients and families which is why we do what we do every day and um, we need to continue to do better every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. I, I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, as we wait for, um, to see if we have any questions that come in, I have a question that I wrote down and I'm sorry if I missed this, um, sure. talking about the adaptive uh, design. And yeah. I was curious, is the adaptive design on a patient by patient basis or you adapt the design for all of the patients enrolled all at once as, as it goes on? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's um, traditionally built on a certain statistical cutoff. There's multiple different types of adaptive design. So I, I don't wanna speak globally about all of them, but I would say that probably most commonly there's a certain number of patients that have to enroll so that you can make the basis on X number of patients out of this you know, proportion of patients, so many did not reach our statistical cutoff that we just don't feel there's reason to continue to enroll. Um, and so you still do need to enroll typically X number of patients to have some initial information to then feed back into the trial itself. Um, but it's not necessarily uh, end of one um, decision-making. And I think that is, um, you know, that's obviously to the benefit too, right? Because there's always outliers and we don't want to make a decision on, on one outlier. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, first question that has come in is, thanks for the great talk. Could you briefly comment on the process of drug administration in the blood-brain barrier in the zebrafish model? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I would have to just to my preclinical colleagues on that because I'm not actually sure um, what the exact method or technique is. Um, if that person would like to reach out to me, certainly we can, I can put them in contact with the right people that are actually doing that in the lab. I'm sorry, that's a gap in my own knowledge. And we, we will connect, we will connect the two of you. Um, Jen, yeah. if you could take, take this person's uh, name down and we can, we can connect you guys. Absolutely, yeah. Uh. Um, the next question that came in is, is, thanks for the talk. I'm not very familiar with clinical trials with um, the drop the loser method. Um, how do you report the results so that other researchers can use that data even if it's not statistically significant? Got it. So in terms of, uh, obviously it's always hard when there's not like an actual dialogue for clarifying questions, <laughs> but um, uh, we it, can make we can allow this person to talk if you want. Um, sure, it might make it easier. I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Okay, amazing. Um, <laughs> I've never been unmuted on a group thing before. Um, so go ahead and ask your your clarifying question, please. I think oh. that's to you, Cassie. Sorry, um, I was trying to move around the screen. Um, 
so when you say statistical significance, so are you assuming, I guess, that we are not reaching like a statistical significance in terms of making the futile decision? Um, yes, I guess my, my kind of question isn't even that precise. Um, it's more that um, if you, you know, it kind of, if we don't follow something out all the way, then maybe another researcher who's kind of coming across that data and is interested in that treatment in this context, but has another take on it, they might not have, um, you know, they'll, they'll be interested in your result, even mm -hmm. though it hasn't kind of potentially played out all the way since you then changed to a different potential treatment. Right, right. And that is the mechanism you, you're like of, a, of the kind of winner takes all almost approach, I guess, or like pick the winner. Um, yeah. We're always going to be picking the one that's kind of marching along above the others. Um, so, I mean, certainly the, the data in terms of kind of the proportion and the levels of futility, like that obviously gets published um, and that information would be readily available. I don't know if that answers your question yeah. um, at the end of the study. So, so even if arms fall out, like that would still potentially get reported on in, in some method. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and usually like, you know, we try to of course design these as well so that we are um, potentially making them feasible numbers, but also like clinically relevant numbers as well. So we're not trying to prematurely um, make decisions as well in terms of when we're working with our biostatisticians you know, we're thinking what's a clinically relevant cutoff, but also what's feasible, like how, how many patients can we realistically enroll and do the study in a timely fashion? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the end of our hour. Um, so I just want to thank you again, Cassie, for the very informative uh, lecture. Um, appreciate it. Appreciate everything that you're doing to help these uh, neuro-oncology patients and Look forward to um, uh, better, better, better treatments, you know, down the road. Great. Thank you so much, Ian, for having me. It's been wonderful. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you on uh, December 16th. Bye-bye.